Today, our keynote speaker is S. Georgia Nugent, Senior Fellow, Council of Independent Colleges, and retired president, Kenyon College. Dr. Nugent was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and attended Princeton University, <clears throat> graduating cum laude in 1973. Subsequently, she earned her PhD in classics at Cornell University. Dr. Nugent taught at Swarthmore College and Brown University before returning to teach at Princeton in 1995. Dr. Nugent became the 18th president of Kenyon College in 2003. After retiring last spring, she was designated to lead the Council of Independent Colleges nationwide initiative to promote both the liberal arts and the effectiveness of independent higher education in preparing the next generation of Americans for leadership in a democratic society. It is in this capacity that Georgia Nugent speaks with us today. As a passionate advocate for the indispensable partnership between leadership and learning. Please join me in welcoming S. Georgia Nugent. Good morning. I'm going to have to adjust a little here. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Southwell alluded to uh, the difference between the those outside this room and those inside this room. And though it's a rather uh, cold and snowy morning this, this morning, I must say I feel like I'm basking in the sunlight of folks who do understand and appreciate the liberal arts. So it may seem that I will be speaking a little bit to the choir, but it's very important that those of us who are in the choir go out and spread that message. And that's something that I'll be talking about today. Um, first, I want to say it's always a pleasure to come back to Chicago. I actually started first grade at uh, Francis Scott Key Elementary School in Cicero. Uh, later, I went to uh, Crystal Lake School. And during my college years at Princeton, uh, I spent the summers um, in Arlington Heights. Now, why would all of that be? <laughs> I had a rather unusual background for a college president. My father trained racehorses. So I actually lived uh, in a trailer uh, at Arlington Park for a number of years. <laughs> so I always feel at home, even when this city is rather windy and, and chilly. I want to especially thank Jerry Fuller uh, for the invitation to join you here this morning, and also Leslie Millinson for making uh, all the arrangements about this, uh, this gathering so, so well and so thoroughly. I'm very pleased to be invited to speak at this 61st meeting, annual forum of the Associated Colleges of Illinois. Um, American higher education is unique in a number of ways, and it has uh, some unique strengths. One of those is what we're seeing here this morning, in a way. That is the contributions of time, talent, thought, and yes, treasure, that private citizens make to the private sector of education, of higher education in America. This is, is a unique uh, strength that we have in this country. And so I want not only to thank you for inviting me to be here to speak, but I want very much to thank you for being here and for caring so much about this kind of higher education that I believe is so crucial to our national identity and success. Today there is a lot of misunderstanding among the general public about higher education in general, and I think particularly about liberal arts education and liberal arts colleges. Many untruths are being very widely circulated, and we should all be concerned about this lack of understanding, not only for the future of our colleges, but for the future of our country. That's why the 620-some members of the Council of Independent Colleges, CIC, 
have launched a national public information campaign. And uh, I find that some of my remarks will echo a number of things that the speakers before me this morning have said, and one of them is entailed here. CIC, the organization, uh, the colleges belonging to that organization, have entitled this national campaign, Securing America's Future which was alluded to before, securing America's future, the power of liberal arts education. We really do believe that those two, a safe and secure and prosperous American future and equally prosperous liberal arts education and liberal arts colleges are in fact intimately intertwined. If we want to continue to foster the innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurial spirit that have contributed so much to American success, we need, as Mr. Southwell just uh, alluded to, we need citizens and leaders with a broad educational background of the type that liberal arts education and liberal arts colleges provide. So this morning I'm going to speak a bit about actually some of those myths that are out there about liberal arts education and I'm doing that to arm you when you hear them uh, to be able to um, refute them with the facts. And I will also admit that I will sneak my own discipline in a little bit which is the discipline of, of classics, uh, Latin and Greek literature. As Steve Jobs now famously said, and I quote, technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. And remember, Jobs may have dropped out of college, Reed College, a, a member of CIC, but it's the fact that he hung around to continue studying calligraphy that yield the multiple fonts Apple has, which was one of its dramatic innovations. The Liberal Arts College, as I said, is a uniquely American institution. It has served us well since the Continental Congress meeting in Princeton's Nassau Hall received word that the treaty definitively granting independence to the American colonies had been signed. Our founding fathers were thoroughly steeped in what was the original liberal arts curriculum, classical education. And by the way, I want to be clear about what the original American liberal arts colleges were. They were pre-professional schools. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, King's College, now Columbia, Queen's College, now Rutgers, all of these were founded in order to train pastors. The curriculum was Hebrew, Latin, and Greek because those were the languages of the sacred texts. So it's a misunderstanding to think, as many do, that liberal arts learning is somehow intended to be impractical or useless. American college students needed that curriculum for their jobs. Maybe we might think of it as the ability to write an app today. These men, America's founders, read Greek and Roman authors assiduously. And in fact, each of them kept what were then called commonplace books. Essentially, these were notebooks of quotations in which they copied what they felt were edifying sentiments from the ancients that they were reading. I think of these jottings as something like the uh, 18th century equivalent of Twitter. Thomas Jefferson's correspondence, for example, was so thoroughly peppered with quotations from ancient Greek that John Adams exclaimed in exasperation, Lord, Lord, what can I do with so much Greek? Yet, Adams himself spent the summer of 1796 before assuming the American presidency, reading the essays of the Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero. As form of preparation for office, this might serve our own politicians a little better than their reliance today on handlers and pollsters. And John Adams wrote to his son, John Quincy Adams, I quote, in company with the Roman authors Sallust, Cicero, Tacitus, and Livy, you will learn wisdom and virtue. You will ever remember that all the end of study is to make you a good man 
and a useful citizen. A good man or woman and a useful citizen. For our forefathers, that ability to be a good and useful citizen was intimately bound up with what we would call today a liberal education. In fact, Jefferson frequently said that if he had to decide between the estate that his father had bequeathed him and the classical education his father had provided, he would undoubtedly have opted for the education. All the end of study, President John Adams wrote, is to make you a good man and a useful citizen. Education is more valuable than wealth, President Jefferson said. That is certainly not what presidents or governors or congressmen or others have been saying in this country for a long time. And I think it's, it's somewhat heartening to look back to President Kennedy in the 60s in a very different tone. In fact, in recent decades, and with increasing intensity since the economic crisis, all that we have heard from policymakers is that the aim of higher education should be wealth and profit, both for individuals and for the country. Most recently, as you know, President Obama has determined that American colleges should be rated, and it appears that rating will be based solely on the starting salaries that graduates earn. I find this particularly interesting given that this idea is advanced by a college graduate whose first job was community organizer. What has happened to the ideal of education for useful and responsible citizenship? And yes, for professional success, for succeeding in, in a business career. Well, I want to emphasize to you that this value is actually alive and well, flourishing in America's more than 600 small private colleges devoted to liberal learning. But we don't hear much about it, or more accurately, we hear a lot of myths about it that are simply untrue. So I want to devote my, the remainder of my time today to some serious myth busting so that you will have the facts and can help to be a part of securing America's future. First, let's be clear about what liberal arts education is and is not. The phrase liberal arts is a term from our Latin heritage. To the Romans, artes liberales, meant the studies appropriate to and necessary for a free human being as opposed to a slave. But today, the historical term liberal arts frequently confuses people. They may think it refers either to liberal politics or to drawing and painting alone, and neither of those is true. Liberal arts is actually the study of a very broad range of human history, accomplishment, and thought with, as we have heard, an emphasis on developing critical thinking skills, on independent judgment, and developing a taste for lifelong learning, that learning that will keep one an innovator, an entrepreneur who's successful. Typically, liberal arts, of course, includes inquiry in the humanities, social sciences, arts, and sciences. Although this is often misunderstood as well, liberal arts has always included the natural sciences. And it evolves over time. On today's liberal arts campus, a student may be studying neuroscience or environmental studies or Arabic, not necessarily the Hebrew, Greek, and Latin that formed the original curriculum. On some campuses, engineering, computer science, or nursing may be taught in a liberal arts mode, which is to say with a greater emphasis on understanding general principles than on memorizing specific data or techniques. Now, let me get down to the myth busting. Here are five big ones. One, liberal arts education is only for the elite. Two, it's prohibitively expensive to attend a liberal arts college. Three, graduates have a staggering amount of debt. Four, this kind of education just isn't practical. And five, liberal arts graduates are unemployable today. 
I would imagine that every one of you has heard and read versions of these statements many times over the last 6, 12, 18 months. And you may be surprised to learn that none of them is true. Number one, liberal arts education is only for the elite. In fact, private liberal arts colleges enroll about the same or a slightly higher percentage of low income and underrepresented students than do the flagship public universities. Nearly 40% of all private college students come from low income backgrounds. Even more important, all students, but especially underrepresented or low income students, graduate at higher rates in the liberal arts colleges. And of course, we're realizing more and more that what's important is not only so-called access to higher education, but completion, actually crossing the finish line and graduating. For Hispanic students, for example, the four-year graduation rate is almost twice as high as it is in public colleges. For those of you here today who are employers, this translates directly into a more diverse, more career-ready workforce. Over the past few years, CIC has teamed up with the Walmart Corporation on a project called the Walmart College Success Awards. 50 of our member colleges, with support from Walmart, concentrated on increasing the retention and success of first-generation students. The results have been remarkable. As a result, we've now developed a repertoire of best practices to increase student persistence and also a network of colleges utilizing those practices to ensure that first-generation college goers succeed. You can read the report of this project, which is called Making Sure They Make It, on the CIC website, which is just cic.org. Second, it's prohibitively expensive to attend a liberal arts college. Now, it is true that what liberal arts colleges do is expensive, offering small classes, providing close personal interaction with full-time faculty members, as well as a residential experience. All of this does cost. But these colleges also offer substantial financial aid to their students. In fact, they offer six times more aid than is provided by the federal government. The result is that for the average student, the net cost of attendance at a small private liberal arts college is very close to that of attending a state school. Despite the rhetoric that we hear about tuition skyrocketing, the fact is that net tuition and fees at private colleges have remained constant in real terms for about a decade. Within the past five years, net tuition and fees at private colleges, again, adjusted for inflation, have actually decreased by 3.5%. I'm tempted to say this is something you don't read about in the papers, but on October 23rd, the New York Times did publish a story citing the research of the uh, economist Sandy Baum on this topic. Third, graduates have a staggering amount of debt. How many times in the past months have you read or heard that American student debt is out of control? It's topped a trillion dollars. This is one of those moments where a good liberal arts education comes in handy. <laughs> For basic statistical literacy, you want to know not only the numerator, how much, but the denominator over how many. Or, I flipped those, I guess, I'm sorry. The fact is the number of students attending college in America has grown dramatically in the past decades from fewer of half all high school graduates to more than two thirds. So that is in 1972, the first summer that I was spending at Arlington Park, 49% of high school graduates went on to college, 49%. In 2011, that number was 68%. In addition, more families from lower, more students from lower income families are attending college. Surely this growth in college going is a good thing for our country. But is it surprising then that the overall amount of debt has grown? Hardly. But what about individual students? 
that's what really matters in a sense, what happens to the individual going to a college. The term of choice in the press these days seems to me to be staggering. Students are graduating with staggering amounts of debt. The New York Times front page story in the summer of 2012 profiling a student who somehow amassed $150,000 of debt for an undergraduate degree captured public imagination. No wonder to the extent that many folks seem to believe this is normal. It is not. Overall, fewer than 3% of undergraduates accumulate that kind of debt, and their number is overwhelmingly in the for-profit sector, where graduation rates are as low as 22%, and loan default rates are higher than that graduation rate. In America's small, private, liberal arts colleges, almost 30% of students graduate with no debt whatsoever. For other graduates, the average amount of debt is now reaching about $30,000. That's not small, and I don't want to make light of it, but it is approximately the same as the cost of a car. Yet there doesn't seem to be much national hand-wringing over young people incurring staggering debt to buy a car. And that automo automobile depreciates the moment you drive it off the lot. The investment in a college degree appreciates over a lifetime. Just how much does it appreciate? Well, in a report released last August, the United States Census Bureau indicated that lifetime earnings for a college graduate exceed those of non-degree earners by $1.3 million. So let's see, a $30,000 investment toward a more than million dollar return. That sounds pretty good to me. Yet that's not what we hear about today in the media. So number four, this kind of education isn't practical. Well, I've heard from the speakers before me that you all know that that's not the case. Um, a liberal arts curriculum offers students both broad exposure to a number of different fields of thought and more in-depth learning in one or more particular methodologies and modes of thought, typically the major and minor. More often than not, these days, a liberal arts education also includes independent research under the guidance of a faculty mentor. And more and more, it also includes internship in an employment environment, much as we heard from Britain. The emphasis is on being able to form independent judgments, articulate cogent arguments, and develop both the tools and the taste for lifelong learning. Recent research shows that 30 million Americans are working in a job that did not even exist in the previous year. And one third of the American workforce changes jobs in any given year. It's not the same folks, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Some predict that by age 38, today's graduates will have had about a dozen different jobs, perhaps even different careers. So in a world where we know that our graduates will be employed in roles that don't even exist today, it's hard to see how the cross-cutting skills of liberal learning are not substantially more practical than training in a specific skill that may well be obsolete almost upon graduation. We should also note that what is useful or practical is often associated today, whether rightly or wrongly, with the so-called STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Certainly, policymakers in Washington and elsewhere are devoting a special attention to America's need for STEM graduates. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> there's frequently a misperception that liberal arts colleges do not produce such graduates in the sciences. Actually, the opposite is true. Small liberal arts colleges show much higher rates of persistence in the study of science among their undergraduates. 
Additionally, graduates of these colleges go on to PhDs in the sciences in a strikingly greater proportion than students at large state universities. And I'll give you my favorite factoid on this matter. Um, CIC has been carrying out the research about science education and the completion of science PhDs, and we will soon publish that as well uh, on the website and, and more broadly. So my factoid is tiny Swarthmore College with about 1,600, 1,600 undergraduates produced over a five-year period exactly the same number of PhDs in physics as did Texas A&M with 45,000 undergraduates. And this is not an outlier. CIC will publish shortly a white paper providing this research. If policymakers want to produce STEM graduates more effectively and efficiently, they must not count out the small independent college sector. And five, liberal arts graduates are unemployable. Well, first, let's note clearly, of course, that the unemployment rate for college graduates, even in the depth of the recession, was about half that for non-college grads. Yet, there seems to be a kind of urban mythology that liberal arts grads are only landing jobs as baristas and burger flippers. Untrue. You may have seen a recent story, again, in the, in the Times that highlighted a particularly successful career placement office at a small private liberal arts college. In this case, it was uh, Wake Forest in North Carolina. The reporter noted that parents there were stunned and pleased to hear that 95% of the college's graduates were either fully employed or in graduate school within six months of graduation. Tucked into the story was the overlooked fact that this statistic is actually comparable for many of our colleges. And here, I'll draw a moment on my own experience at Kenyon. We have been serving, surveying our graduates post-graduation to learn what they're doing. The most recent survey showed that one year after graduation, only 3% of Kenyan grads were actively looking for employment. Well, but a skeptic might claim maybe that 97% is underemployed. They're the baristas and the burger flippers. Well, no. 80% of our respondents to the survey indicated that their current employment, quote, allows me to continue to grow and learn, and were very satisfied with the employment they had secured. Do our graduates feel that education, their education was effective in preparing them for work? 87% responded positively to this question. Now, do I wish that that number were 100%? Of course, and there's clearly room to do better. But I think even an 87% achieved correspondence between, between liberal arts education and effective job preparation runs strongly counter to much that we're hearing about higher education. And yet, how often have you heard the refrain, what can you do with an English degree? What can you do with a Latin degree, for heaven's sake? The answer is anything. Let me provide you a few examples. These are taken from recent studies of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Michael Eisner of Disney majored in English and theater at Denison. The CEO of Procter & Gamble was a French and history major at Hamilton College. Former Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Paulson, majored in English. The CEOs of Corning and Federated Department Stores both majored in East Asian Studies, one at Earlham College and one at Connecticut College. Harold Varmus, winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine and one time head of the NIH, National Institutes of Health, majored in English, as did the former CEO of Xerox. Examples like these are legion. Again, they are not outliers. At CIC, we're collecting the stories of liberal arts graduates and what they've done with their educations. Thus far, we have astronauts, entrepreneurs, opera singers, inventors, you name it. 
actually, the question is, what can't you do with a degree in English or philosophy or French or physics? Those of us who believe strongly in liberal arts education do so for many reasons. This is one thing that became clear as we prepared for our campaign at CIC. But I tend to group these reasons under three categories. And I'll um, condense my remarks a bit here. I think most of us tend to feel that liberal arts learning is valuable for reasons that are personal, political, or professional. By professional, I mean the kinds of data I've been citing here. This really does help you to succeed in a career. By political, I mean participation in civic society, in our communities, in our states. Uh, we know that liberal arts graduates both volunteer and vote at a higher rate than other graduates or than other citizens. But by personal, I mean what I'm really passionate about and what I think many of you are passionate about. And that really has to do with the quality of life, not necessarily the number on your paycheck. The liberal arts learning that is broad, that exposes you to many different fields, that in the residential environment exposes you to many new and different people, simply makes for a more interesting, richer, more satisfying life. And finally, I think in many ways, that's the most important bottom line, if you will. I'll leave you with the words of a friend and colleague. In one of the very best books that has come out in recent years, I think, on education, Andrew Del Banco's College, What It Was, Is, and Should Be, this Columbia-based scholar cites the words he found in the manuscript diary of a student at a small Methodist college in Virginia in the 1850s. And, and he cites this as what he calls perhaps the best formulation of college. And I would add what an education for true citizenship should be. The young man wrote in his diary, oh, that the Lord would show me how to think, and how to choose. Thank you.